Welcome to Athlete Optimization. Reimagine. This is the Restoic Podcast. Welcome back. We were so excited today to get our first guest on the podcast, Kaylee Gilcrest. She is a pro surfer, Olympic gold medalist. She's currently training for the upcoming Olympics with the USA water polo team. With that being said, Danny, what were some of your highlights from today's chat with Kaylee? I would say the top three things that kind of caught my eye and really were just so refreshing was one, how to reignite that fire and really how to channel that passion especially right now with COVID, a lot of people are losing that motivation, having difficulty with really getting out of bed and getting back into the the gym or training, however they do that. The second piece was the importance of a support system. She really emphasized how during training through difficulties, uncertainty, being able to lean on people that you trust, that love, that have your best interest really plays a pivotal role. And then finally, I'm a huge Kobe fan. So anything Kobe related is just amazing. She touched on how her mentorship with Kobe really shaped her recovery and pushed her even to this day as a huge motivating factor. That was such a cool moment just to hear that personal advice from Kobe and to be able to now share that through our listeners and to our audience that's out there. Um, I loved that too. I mean, just being a huge Kobe fan as well, but it was just powerful, powerful stuff. And so Kaylee was such an awesome guest. We're so excited to get everybody listening to this episode. Before we get that started, Danny, anything else that you want to mention? I would just say really listen with an open mind, start to better understand what makes a world champion tick. And then also really, really kind of tune into her approach on perspective, perspective on sports or, you know, business, whatever it is, relationships is a game changer. She shared that beautifully. And I think that's just something that can resonate with anybody. And without further ado, enjoy this episode with Kaylee Gilchrist. And while prepping for this conversation, Kaylee, I saw that you actually live in Newport Beach as your hometown. Is that still where you live today? Yeah, born and raised and still here. Very cool. So you might know this, maybe not, but Danny and I met in Orange County. I was living in Newport Beach, 41st Street there for a while before I was married. So definitely we're familiar with the area and it's very cool to see that uh, that's where you're at. How's everything going with COVID and the lockdown and just in your life today? Yeah. First off, thanks for having me on the show. I'm excited to chat. And I mean, everyone's life has just been turned upside down, I think. Um, we were prepping for the Tokyo Olympic games and we were kind of in the thick of training. We were grinding six hours, six hours a day, six days a week and getting to the point just to the funs part. You know, the fun part is when the teams announce you get to host some games in front of your friends and family in the USA, and then you're off to the Olympics. So we kind of got shut down right before all of that. And, you know, like any, anybody, it was no, no one could expect what happened. And of course we realize there's so much more important things going on in the world right now than sport, but we're excited. We started training back up June 1st. Obviously it's very mellow, um, no contact two groups, but just being back on the pool deck with the girls and seeing some familiar faces. And, uh, I think it's more of connecting with one another rather than training to be our top tip top shape right now, but, um, it's good. We finish up training on tomorrow actually and we have some time off and then we'll get back at it in september with hopes of you know playing water polo together soon i'm glad to hear that i know the impacts are being felt all around the sports world specifically with Restoic, we're communicating with high schools and collegiate athletes and it's it's so sad to see because the reality is there's 8.5 million of these student athletes at any given time in the u.s and currently they're sidelined and they have a lot of uncertainty there's programs being shut down and so just getting some of that hope that you know there is still something to look forward to that we can get back to some of that life that we were enjoying before all this hit it's uh it's refreshing and it's one question i wanted to make sure i asked and since we started the conversation with this subject matter do you have any advice and or tips in terms of how you handled this lockdown to still try to proactively get better and just improve as an athlete, as a person, because it is easy to see the distance from your teammates and from that practice environment that you're so used to being something where you just, you're, you're on the sidelines and you know, you're feeling down, you're feeling upset. You're thinking about the future and the uncertainty, but you can also see it as an opportunity. And it could be an opportunity where you have this newfound time to work on skills that maybe you don't have the time to do in your normal everyday practice and approach to competition. So I would just love to hear if you have anything to share on how you maximize the time thus far. Yeah, I mean, 100%. I think I have a little bit of a unique situation and story. 
Um, I got injured and we can dive into that uh, later in the convo, but I got injured in July of last year in 2019 freak accident. We were celebrating our world championship win and the balcony collapsed at the nightclub we were all at. And I um, had a severe left leg injury and, you know, there was moments there where I didn't know how bad it was. And there was a lot of uncertainty. And at that time I thought my Olympics was going to be taken from me. So in a weird way, that injury and, and those feelings and emotions I had during, you know, not just that night, but spending days in the hospital in a foreign country to months of rehab. I think that almost prepped me for um, this pandemic and, and the pause uh, in a weird way. So I've almost been thankful for the experience of I have to prep me for, you know, having this pause again. I think something I've learned this past year more than ever is just to give some kindness and grace, not only to yourself, but to everyone. I remember having that conversation right when the announcement was made that the Olympics were postponed. And for me, I follow news. I kind of, I kind of saw it coming. I was already prepped and prepared for it. And I know some teammates, it was like, you know, they were grieving a loss. And at first I was like, but didn't you see it coming? Like what's going on? But then I realized, you know what? Everyone goes through these, these situations differently and just to give them the space that they needed to grieve. And eventually months down the line, we'll, we'll pull it back together and then we'll start refocusing for our next goal, which is 2021. But, um, I was dealing with a lot from that injury and just from mentors passing that I think this time, this pause allowed me to focus on slowing down, which is my entire life. I've been trying to juggle two sports, trying to be social and trying to be a good friend, teammate, family member, and so on and so forth that I rarely slow down. So I think this was a blessing in disguise. Obviously, I don't want to be insensitive to, you know, COVID and to those that have been directly affected, you know, by this pandemic. But for me, um, just slowing down, going to therapy, you know, priority t- prioritizing myself for once and um, it's been a blessing. I, I got reconnected with the ocean. I was surfing more than I've surfed in years and, um, still working on a lot of things for sure, but hoping that this work that I've put in the past few months will get me to where I want to be in the future. So Kaylee, that is incredible that you're sharing that because I think, you know, really mental toughness can mean a lot of different things, but based on your experience, what you just shared, I mean, you're kind of epitomizing that term with your recovery because I've read it was required about a hundred stitches. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, the, this is all in broken English. So we really don't even know they had to do three layers of stitches and the doc's like, yeah, I lost count about 100 in his, you know, Korean broken English. So yeah, we really don't know how much, but the laceration tore three muscles. So I guess the best way to explain it, um, is almost like I tore three muscles and was repairing that. Um, and it affected my whole lower left leg. And that's a scary thing for any injury. I mean, people have in sports, ACLs, Achilles, whatever the case might be, this is unique, but can you just kind of share your initial thoughts of, of like, wow, where is my career going? Will I ever get back? And kind of what was your process? I know you had mentioned obviously having a great mentality about it, but how did you take that step-by-step approach into, you know, accepting what is moving forward and trying to be stronger for it? Sure. I guess, um, I'll start with the actual night. You know, I never looked down at my leg until I woke up from surgery. I didn't really want to see how bad it was. And I think I was also in shock and I was losing a lot of blood and there was a few scary moments there, but the water polo community just, you know, reacted so quickly and honestly made the night as easy going as it possibly could be with the tragic incident. And there was a few South Koreans that lost their, their lives that night. So it's very spooky. It's, I think it's a little bit different. Obviously an injury is an injury and it's scary and you know, your future is uncertain, but this was just bizarre because it wasn't like an injury. I was playing in the sport I love, you know? So that was some trauma that I had to deal with. And I remember waking up from surgery and finally a few hours later, the doc comes in, he's like three or four months to running, which basically meant to sport. And I remember being so upset, so scared that like, I didn't have three or four months and almost within like one minute, I caught myself being like, I was almost mad that I had that thought because look, here I am. I have my life. My friends have theirs. I am on the road to what will hopefully be a hundred percent recovery. And I think that perspective that I gained within one minute of my doctor telling me that information kind of carried me throughout my entire rehab process. And, um, you know, I'm a huge Kobe Bryant fan and our doctor or our trainer, Larnie Bokirin named my rehab, the Mamba mission. And the Mamba mission obviously grew into so much more. And we started off as just phases and, you know, what we wanted to take off of, you know, the rehab. And then of course, Kobe 
uh, became a mentor of mine and I reached out to him and we were shooting messages. I was picking his brain. He gave me some of his contacts to help rehab. And, um, of course, like, you know, he's my childhood hero. So I was geeking over that. And then, so when he passed in, in January, um, not only did the Mamba mission take on so much more meaning, but it definitely brought up some emotions that I was clearly pushing down, you know, as athletes, it's kind of, you put the horse blinders on and you just grind. And that's what I did. I grinded physically and, you know, 5 30 AM to 7 30 PM every single day. But I realized after Kobe passed and the trauma was kind of brought back up and, you know, some panic attacks happened, I realized that, you know, there's some mental things that I need to take care of. And, uh, going back to what you said about the pandemic and the pause, you know, that was the pause I almost needed to take care of those things that I I've clearly been pushing away. Kaylee, that's, that's incredible. We appreciate you sharing that. And, and again, um, you know, I don't know how much you know about Ian and I, we've played basketball together. And so Kobe was a big hero of ours as well. Uh, we didn't know him personally, but it, I think his passing really has impacted everybody in the sports world because you know, he epitomized that, that Mamba mentality, that pushing your limits and really maximizing your own potential. And so, you know, while we're on that topic, I know he was a valuable mentor. He shared a lot of information for you, but is there any piece of advice that stuck out the most for you that you'd like, like to share with us? Yeah, actually, yeah, I know it's that Kobe's passing and the seven others is just insane and how it rocked the, the whole entire world. And I think that just shows um, how much he affected not over the sports world, but just the world in general. And I think that's the mom mentality. There's the curiosity and wanting to better yourself doesn't just mean in sports, but it kind of means in life. But I was fortunate of asking him a question at the USA surf team committee um, at the Mamba sports Academy. This must've been 2018. And I've always taken somewhat, I don't really like pride as a word, but I guess taken somewhat of pride in how I've balanced things. Cause I'm doing two sports. I, I like to think I'm a good friend, a good family member. And so I, I picked his brand about balance and I, I just asked how he viewed balance. And um, he just said, you know, there's no such thing as perfect balance. Of course, you always want to, you know, reach this perfect balance, but it doesn't exist. You're continuously on this tightrope and you're getting swayed in each direction. And you're almost just trying to do a dance without falling off the tightrope. So maybe one side's basketball or career or sport pulling you. And then when you go and sway a little bit too far left, that's when your family, you know, has a tough conversation with you or brings you back and you're just kind of swaying between, you know, whatever it may be for me, it's, you know, usually athletics and family and friends and in college, it was, you know, sorority and academics as well. And it's just being trying to figure out the best swaying and the most graceful sway on this tightrope. Yeah. I mean, that's so powerful to hear. I think balance is something that you're, you never perfect, right. But it's something that you can continually strive towards. And it sounds like that's part of the message that he imparted on you and just getting back to just that whole Mamba mentality, the mindset that embodies getting better each day. You know, that's how I've heard Kobe describe it. And I think it's no matter what you're pursuing because it relates to mindset, it's transferable into other areas of your game. And so even if you weren't consciously participating in things such as self-talk or visualization as you prepared for a game or you were in a game or post-game, what types of exercises as it relates to mental skills do you think served you most and or do you still look to try to implement into your career today? Um, I guess mental skills, uh, preparation, I think, and that's obviously physical, but I think the physical preparation prepares you mentally as well. Um, and our coach in the water polo, Adam Kikorian does a great job prepping us. We work with a sports psych, Peter Haberl, who does an amazing job and he focuses a lot on mindfulness. Um, so I think that's something that's helped me in our team with success. But for me, I've always done visualizing. Like, I remember when I'm a little kid, I was sleeping in bed trying to go to sleep and I'm visualizing whether it's like me holding up a world title trophy, surfing on the world tour or on the podium with a gold medal around my neck. And I just think the more you visualize, um, obviously those successful moments, but also just like your actual movements in the water, shooting, defending, uh, it helps you just do it rather naturally in person and in, in, in the present moment. That's amazing to share. It's kind of one of the things that Ian and I are seeing more and more as we're discussing, you know, these topics with top tier athletes and that mentality is just very different. I guess the question I have for you is what would you ask or what kind of advice would you share to high school athletes? Let's just say that haven't really implemented, you know, what you just shared in visualization, seeing themselves on the podium with a gold medal. Uh, what a piece of advice would you let them know that really could help them out and, 
get out of their comfort zone. Yeah. I think just that is just get out of your comfort zone and mental practice and mindfulness looks completely different. And you may not be a person that enjoys running through an app, or you may not be a person that enjoys somebody telling you what to do. And that's fine. You can find your own niche that will still benefit you and ultimately get you to that next level of your, of your game. And if you truly want to do reach that, if you want to reach that next level, then to me, it's just, you know, makes easy sense to just go for that next level, which is the mindfulness and the mental side. You can go to the gym and you can bang out a hundred reps of whatever or swim a million laps, but you still might be missing something. And that could be the difference between your dreams and not, and not reaching your dreams. It is so true. I mean, there's so many benefits as it relates to mindfulness as well. I think there's certainly a stigma that's still associated with mindfulness. Some folks would see that as perhaps a little woo woo, if you will. Um, and that's okay. Everybody's, you know, you can have that opinion about it, but I think when you dive into the actual science is when it starts to get really exciting for us. And that's why with Restoic, we felt like, especially serving the athlete community, we needed to come with sports psychology and sports science in support of everything that we're sharing through our programs. And so that means that these are proven methods to reduce anxiety, handle your emotions more efficiently. And I guess piggybacking on Danny's previous question, in terms of anxiety, in terms of just kind of enjoy the moment more and let go of negative thoughts, are there any daily practices that you have as well? Because I loved what you just shared about visualization and imagery, but on that daily basis, whether that's an affirmation that you perhaps tell yourself, a gratitude practice, is there anything like that that you've incorporated into your life as well? Yeah, I think, um, to be honest, in the past, I would go through waves and really be geeked out of it. And then, of course, just life happens and you run away from your routines and all of a sudden you're practicing seven hours a day and you're waking up and the first thing you want is coffee. And so what I'm trying and working on now with this extra time is making it a part of my everyday practice and routine. And right now I'm starting super simple and I've been working with a couple of therapists and my EDMR therapist, Dr. P amazing guy, he were teaching or he taught me just some affirmations to help. So right now I'm just breathing in saying, I am strong, breathing out. I am courageous and resilient. So those are my three, I am statements and just trying to do it. Even it's two minutes a day, whether I just find some time to do it once or five times a day. And it's been rather easy to implement, you know, I mean, with swimming, you you have to breathe in and breathe out almost every stroke or every other stroke. So that's kind of where I found myself doing it most is while I'm swimming, or if I'm out in the water, sitting on my board, surfing, and just I'm out there by myself, it's super simple. And I think just the affirmations and the I am statements, it just kind of grounds you. And that's one thing that helps me come back to the present and really b believe those statements just through everything that I've been able to endure um, this past year is I, I do believe that I am strong and I am resilient and, you know, I am courageous. And I think that just helps me kind of take a second, come back to the present and do whatever tasks I, I, I'm doing at that moment. That's awesome. And you did mention the ocean again, and I know you've mentioned that you surf. And so I would love to just ask you some topics as it relates to getting back into the water and being a professional surfer in your own right. You do have some really epic pictures and videos, I must say, on your Instagram page and website, which we'll include in the show notes. I, I was really enjoying those before I reached out. That I was like, wow, this is really cool. So I would just love to know, how has this always been a passion of yours? And then how did you begin this pursuit to compete? as a surfer versus just enjoy it, um, as kind of more of a casual practice and, or just part of like your, you know, your escape. I mean, being someone who grew up part of their life in Orange County, Danny and I would go to the beach quite often, hang out, we're going swimming, we're playing beach volleyball, but we were not surfers. And I could, I say that only because I tried surfing and was just absolutely terrible. But for folks who have grown up there their entire life, I know it's second nature. So was that your experience where you, did you grow up at the beach or was this something you fell into later in life? Yeah. I mean, I'm down on the peninsula and yeah, I just picked up all sports. I was the ultimate tomboy growing up, you know, didn't have too many close girlfriends, but I hung out with all the guys and we had such a solid crew, just, you know, all lived, six of us all lived within a couple blocks from one another. So, um, first love was basketball, then, uh, then surfing and water polo popped up at the age of eight. And I remember I, I did Corky Carroll surf school to learn how to surf. It was like, my mom wanted me to get out of the house one summer. And I did it with a couple of buddies and, you know, I, I, didn't fall in love with it right away. But as soon as my friends started getting boards and biking to the beach, I was like, Oh gosh, they're going to get better than me. Like I need to do this. And that was just kind of my mindset, um, was surfing 
I just wanted to be better than the boys. And luckily they were trying some creative maneuvers and innovative maneuvers. So I just figured that's what I would do. And slowly but surely I started getting recognized and uh, friends and family were like, Oh, maybe she should do some contests. Uh, the N- NSSA is national scholastic surfing association. Um, that's kind of like our league. And that's where I started and got more recognition as I got a little bit better skill set and got uh, recognized by the USA surf team, traveled the world and just kind of continued with my career as much as I could while also balancing water polo. So uh, first, it's a passion. I think with all sports, you fall in love. You know, at the age of eight, I don't know if I was dreaming of becoming a professional surfer. I just loved it. And I love to compete with the boys. And um yeah, I still love it. And I have hopes after my water polo career is over that I can give it one good shot on the world qualifying series and hopefully make it to the big leagues, but still just enjoying surfing every day. And right now, knowing my focus is on water polo, I can go out in the ocean and I'm not, I don't put as much pressure as myself of um, kind of working on maneuvers and heat strategies and all that stuff. I just go out there and it's kind of my mental escape right now. So I love that surfing can be both. It can be you know, my, my career and wanting to get better, or can I just go flow in the ocean with a couple of buddies, mess around on longboards and have the best time ever. So surfing is, is a blessing in, in those both ways. That's just awesome that you love something so much and it's obviously paid off because you're doing incredible things. Uh, you know, speaking on that topic of, of passion, cause that's really what drives people to excel. What kind of advice would you give to you know, amateur athletes who perhaps are going through a struggle right now with COVID and not really knowing what's going to happen? Are they going to have a season? Is it cut short? Just the, all that uncertainty that comes along with that. So the, the athletes that are perhaps losing that fire, that passion, and maybe losing motivation, what kind of piece of advice would you share with them to, to get back on that horse, to keep pushing forward and to uh, really achieve their dreams? Yeah, well, I would first say, you know, that is totally fair and valid that you're feeling that way. And you know, I'm sure many professional athletes and Olympic athletes feel that way. And I I've gone through slumps in the past few months because of it. Um, knowing that the target date is pushed a year and all the uncertainty that follows. So that's fine. But at the same time, you can't just continue that. If you want to get better, you have to accept it, you know, maybe take some time off. That's, that's okay. And then when you do come back, come back to your values and your standards. And if you don't have those set for yourself, maybe have a little project. What does you as a high school person want to represent not just an athlete, but as a person, do you want to be passionate? Do you want to be industrious? Do you want to inspire gratitude? You know, just go through a list of values and define them for yourself. And then whenever you're getting lost or you're kind of not feeling motivated or you're just don't know really what the purpose is, you can go back to your values and then you remember, Oh yeah, that's who I am. I am Kaylee Gilchrist who is, you know, the courageous, resilient, strong person. And I think that kind of grounds you and reminds you of what, why you're doing it. And, um, hopefully you can find reasons why you're doing it, not just for yourself. And I think that's one thing that's helped me is doing it for my family members, my teammates, for all those people that have been there. Some from the eight year old me to the 28 year old me, because there's so many people that help you along this journey. And a lot of that for me is just gratitude and especially all the people that happened helped me after my injury. I'm kind of doing this uh, for them, for Kobe, you know, for coach Barnett, my water polo high school coach that for- unfortunately passed away. You know, there's just, the list goes on and on. And I think that helps me get out of bed rather than just doing it for myself. I don't know of a better place to end this podcast just because I simply feel we've put in so much super insightful, interesting, heartfelt information from your end um, out there into the world. And I want to be mindful of your time. So let us just say thank you, first of all, for sharing your story and for sharing that feedback. It's not every day you get a gold medalist who's an actively training for the Olympics to be able to come on and share some advice with the broader audience and especially those student athletes that we serve. And so with that in mind, as we shift gears and start the wrap up process, is there anything that you wanted to shout out or mention, uh, maybe fo- where folks can follow you, anything like that, um, as we close this out. Yeah, sure. First, I just want to thank you guys. You know, Ian and Danny, what you guys are doing is really special, and I think a lot of people are going to benefit from it. So appreciate it and appreciate you. Um, you can follow me Instagram and Twitter. My Instagram's Kaylee Gilchrist. Twitter is K Gilchrist fifteen. And yeah, post most on Instagram, but just follow my journey and um, come aboard the Mamba mission. We will post all that information into the show notes as well for everybody listening. And Kaylee, 
thank you so much. I hope you have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you. You guys too. Thank you again for listening to this special edition interview episode. If you enjoyed it, we'd love for you to subscribe and we appreciate five-star reviews. Additionally, if you can share this with a friend, that always makes a huge difference as we begin our podcast journey. And if you're new to Restoic, stick around. You're about to learn all about us. Until next time. What's a strong body without a strong mind? Today, student athletes report mental health and wellness as their number one challenge. Amplified by a demanding culture and social media, the pressure that athletes face has never been greater. And with the difference between skills, strength, and athleticism growing smaller, the world's elite athletes have begun journeying inwards to gain their competitive edge. Driven by sports science, Restoic is a resource for athletes at all levels, who seek to train like the pros and optimize their performance through mental skills training, ranging from audio programs and meditations to our nationwide network of mental performance coaches. We serve mindful athletes by providing balance, bringing their energy and focus in alignment with their goals. Train the mind, the body will follow. Elevate your game at Restoic.com. Remember, kid, there's heroes and there's legends. Heroes get remembered, but legends never die. Follow your heart, kid. You never go wrong.